Well, kia ora koutou and welcome everybody to the Aotearoa Council Climate Network. Uh, really pleased to have you here today. And um, again, thank you to Janet and Graydon for sharing your um, wonderful work exploring how um, different communities are responding to climate change throughout New Zealand. So it's going to be really insightful and uh, thank you for sharing that work with us. I'll hand over to you now to introduce you, yourselves and your work. Thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou, I'm uh, called Janet Stevenson Tako Ingoa. I'm, I'm Janet Stevenson and I'm at the Centre for Sustainability at the University of Otago. And on the on the um, presenter group today is Graydon Diprose from Manaki Whenua, um, Nanki Research, and also Sophie Bond, who's similarly from Otago University. And the fourth member of the team, Merata Kafaru, I think can't make it, um, but um, she's, she's here in spirit. Um, <laughs> So I'll just start with a, um, a brief karakia um, to set the scene and then we'll move into talking about what the research is all about. Kia tau te rangi marie, o te rangi e tu iho nei, o papa tuanuku e tākoto nei, o te tao e afi nei. Ki runga i a tātou katoa, huie taikie. So, Kia ora koutou again, um, and Graydon, you might like to, yeah, thank you, put the first slide up, and that's just introducing who we are and where we're from, and we are here to talk today for about half an hour about um, research that we're doing called Innovations for Climate Adaptation that's funded by the Deep South National Science Challenge, and it, it's a two-year project, we're just over halfway through, and this today is an opportunity for us to share some interim findings with you, and the, the second half hour really is to get feedback from you, any questions, but also is what we're talking about with you today chiming with your experience as well? Are there, are there things that we are um, picking up that are accurate or inaccurate, or are there other stories that you can share with us to, to deepen our understanding? And maybe the next slide, Graydon. Hopefully it will come through. Great. So, when we were designing this research, uh, we talked to a lot of councils and a lot of um, Māori organisations, we, we, a mana whenua organisation, so organisations of, of iwi, of hapu, of different forms of, um, of Māori organisations that are, that, that are absolutely place-based, about how they were seeing the challenge of climate adaptation and how they were responding. And we're interested in both councils and mana whenua organisations because both of them are what we call place responsible authorities. They are, they are firmly fixed in a location. They're not going away. And so they've got an ongoing sense of responsibility for that place. And as we know, climate change adaptation is very much a place specific thing. Um, it is specific to the people of the place and specific to the actual attributes of that place as well. And so any responses to climate change is something that is very much going to be of enormous importance to, to mana whenua as well as to councils and, and hopefully jointly um, taking action on that. Um, but when we when we started talking to councils and, and mana whenua organisations, um, we found that almost inevitably they were saying things like, this is such new stuff, we don't really know what we're doing, but we're doing stuff anyway. And, and we were really caught by this, we're doing stuff anyway. And it seemed to us that, that across the board, even in the absence of legislation that was saying you need to be doing this or you need to be doing that, <clears throat> there was a lot of innovation happening, a lot of initiatives that, that um, organisations were, were just doing trialing, practicing, seeing how it went, some were working and some weren't. And we thought, why don't we design this research about, about capturing these innovations and, and seeing how people are, are um, rolling them out and what their experiences are and how it's working. So when we, um, I think we might be on the next slide now. Oh, sorry, just, just introducing. Where, so we designed this to, to cover three uh, case study regions where we have at least one mana whenua organisation and at least one district or city council and at least one regional council. And so one, uh, one case study is in the Taranaki area, another in the Bay of Plenty area and another in the Otago area. And 
what we are doing in terms of our methodology is, is carrying out interviews with council staff every six months um, over the two years. So we're halfway through. We've had two sets of interviews so far with council staff. Um, and then with mana whenua organisations, um, again, going back to them at least every six months um, for, for um, kōrero, um, recorded discussions and informal discussions as well. Um, and also um, hui with representatives from those groups, um, bringing them together to discuss their experiences. And all of that supplemented with other information as well. So what we're going to talk about today is um, the, the, some of the interim findings in two groups. First of all, I'm going to talk about some of the, the findings relating to the mana whenua organisations that we're working with. Um, and then uh, Graydon's going to talk about some of the results from talking to council staff, as Sophie's also been talking with council staff and, and with Okaha, so she will have some insights that she can bring into play um, at some point. Um, and we will then stop and, and Graydon will facilitate a bit of a discussion across um, all of you around um, kind of how this chimes with you, with you as I said, and any, any feedback you've got on the findings and any questions you have. But I thought I'd share with you um, what, what the mana whenua um, um, contributors to this research are saying to us. And I think um, for many of you as, as councils, obviously you will be working with, with, um, with iwi or hapu or warai committees or post-governance settlement um, organisations or others on aspects of climate adaptation. And we thought it would be interesting for you to see kind of what the stories are more generally that are emerging here. And in each slide, I've got a, a quote um, from one of the groups. Um, but obviously, mana whenua are already experiencing lots of, of climate change impacts from erosion of coastal Urupa, um, flooding of marae in some instances, damages to roads, to, to places that, that, that are important to them and, and other infrastructure. Um, silting, flooding, erosion, all of those things that you get with, with heavy weather conditions. Um, notable loss of water quality in rivers and streams, um, both from there being less water during droughts or too much water during floods. Um, severe water shortages and the impacts of the, that those things are having on food resources. Mahinga Kai, more sort of the wild food gathering um, locations and Marakai gardens that, that people are growing um, in, in around Varai or households or, or kainga. So there's a quote here, one hapu off their own bat had already been through the process of moving a marae that's been flooded in the last few years and the writing's on the wall. So they've taken things in their own hands and moved their marae off the river and up to a hill. So obviously already taking action on these issues. And the, the concerns of the future are obviously that these impacts will be worsening over time. It'll be impacting on the health of te taio, so the environmental health more generally will be impacted. Um, in some instances, marae, urupa and areas of housing are under direct threat over, over coming decades. So if and, and protect these places or do we, do we start to think about relocation? Um, they're concerned about an uneven understanding of climate change across their own people um, and that data on likely impacts um, for the future is, is quite hard to get or at least expensive to get. And um, so there's very generic information that's freely available, but getting it down to the local level, how is it going to impact our lands and our resources and our special places, that can be really, really expensive. And also that climate change is just one of multiple challenges that, that, um, that Māori organisations are faced with. Uh, many of them are already dealing with things like um, having input into, into um, resource consents, um, dealing with, with housing and health issues amongst their own iwi, dealing with environmental issues, um, dealing with costs of living, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And climate change is just on top of this, exacerbating all of those responsibilities. And here's another quote um, from another community. A lot of our whānau live along the river in low-lying areas and the housing is sub substandard. They're entirely off-grid. There's only one way in and one way out. And in the event that there was to be a serious catastrophic event, our people are all stuck. In the event that we need to move, where can we move to? Because we've got nowhere to move to. So these sorts of issues are, are of serious concern. 
But in the face of that, um, mana whenua are undertaking some amazing um, actions to in, and initiatives to respond to these challenges. And one of those is developing climate strategies and plans. And th these are these are three of the um, climate strategies or plans that have been produced um, by um, the groups that we're talking to. Um, one from Naroru Kitahi, um, one from um, Kaitahu, and one from the Makatu um, um, Collective, Makatu Iwi Collective. And um, a quote here from developing the Naitahu strategy, uh, Te Runga Runanga or Naitahu strategy team went around each of the Runaka, finding out what people knew about climate change, what impacts they thought would be priorities in their area for each of the 18 Runaka areas. And then from that came the Naitahu climate strategy. So a lot of outreach amongst their own people, and that's typical of, of these climate strategies, in order to develop the ideas within these strategies. And while each strategy is quite unique, quite specific to, to that iwi or, or, or hapu, they have some common characteristics. And, and one of those is, is seeing climate change as an op opportunity as well as a threat. Um, and, and in that, talking very much about how, how mana whenua have always had to adapt to, to various aspects of climatic change. And so this is a sort of more of a continuity rather than something that's completely new to them in terms of mātauranga. There's a, a strong focus also on, across them all, on not just, just looking at adapting to climate change as in responding to the impacts, but more broadly focusing on enhancing um, oranga tangata me oranga whenua. So looking at enhancing the health of people alongside the health of the environment. So very much a, a holistic response. Um, so they're working on things like improving biodiversity, improving water quality, improving food security, housing quality, and haura, so health of the people. And, and some very specific actions across all of those things have been talked about. Additionally, the strategies all centre on, on core principles, um, such as rangatiratanga, um, restoration of Modi, so, so the sort of um, the, the inner vitality of, of, of people and, and the environment, whanangatanga, so working collectively as, 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 as people, Matauranga, so bringing knowledge, Māori knowledge to bear on these issues, and kaitiakitanga, the, the, the ethic of, of stewardship of, or responsibility for reciprocally caring for the environment. And, and interestingly, some of them talk about climate response, right? so rather than separating mitigation and adaptation into, into kind of categories, they talk about climate response as an integrated um, response that, that brings those things together. And another quote from, from one of the, the groups that developed their own strategy, there was a very deliberate effort to centre our climate thinking around our own historical narrative in a way that would be engaging and digestible for Udi. The climate strategy guides our whole work stream and the next steps will be adaptation plans or climate plans for the marae. So they, in, the, in, that, in other words, they've developed an overarching strategy for the iwi and now they're working with each marae to develop a, a localised climate uh, plan for each marae individually with the people there. Um, also, they're very much engaging with their own people on, on, on climate response. So, um, for example, using social media to inform and engage um, hokainga, but both people who are, are based um, in, in, on, on the, the kainga, on, the public, on, on their own lands, and those who live away, um, who they're wanting to involve more in the future planning. Um, designing and carrying out surveys with their own people, so designing their own surveys. Um, collating local observations of climate change and carrying out hui to engage their own people on understanding climate change, sharing information, upskilling and, and planning for the future. Um, and, and these hui, um, we recently attended one, one of these and it, it really brought together people from right across the spectrum, um, old people and, and young people, people who worked, people who didn't work. Um, and, and it was a really um, inspiring day actually seeing how people were engaging with, 
with getting to grips with what climate change really was. Um, and a quote here from, from one of the, the leaders of, um, of the hui that, that I just mentioned, um, I found out today that there was a lot of people whose eyes were widened and the, the very people who six months ago were saying to me, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. I've seen a transition from them and now they're seriously, seriously interested in being part of it. So these hui as a way to bring their own people on board and them being part of the plans for the future. Um, and they're taking practical action now. So as I said, restoring biodiversity, working on freshwater quality, working on improving Mahinga Kai, redeveloping gardens, um, improving housing and, and infrastructure, building cap capacity and capability amongst their own people, and working towards these relocations or safeguarding of valued places in, in situ. Um, and a quote here, we're quite focused on biodiversity management and freshwater as those two things are really key in terms of survival. Fresh water is obviously going to sustain us and climate change is synonymous with the biodiversity loss, so we need to work in that space. So as I said, this really holistic view towards planning for the future. But they also make the point is that they can't do all of this on their own after generations of disenfranchisement um, through colonialism and, and other actions that have deprived them of, of lands and capacity. So they need resourcing and capacity and to be at the decision making table. So they're all seeking to work closely with regional and city or district councils in their areas. And the last two slides are really all about that. So what they are keen to do is to is to work with councils closely on adaptation as well as on other issues, obviously. And these these include um, establishing recognition by councils and engaging with councils at a mana to mana level, um, gaining decision making powers as guaranteed by Te Tiriti so that they can take their desired actions to respond to climate change as well as other issues. So really, um, and this is, is, be, is reinforced in fact by, by the National um, Adaptation Plan, which talks about exactly this kind of response um, at a government level. So what might that actually look like in reality? Um, so kaitiakitanga is another aspect of, of, of working with councils to implement their enduring responsibilities to care for people and the natural environment and, and this rebuilding of the strength and health of communities and places in a holistic way. And finally, um, just some examples of, of how this is happening. Oh, there's a quote. Sorry. There's a quote there. <laughs> There's an importance to building a relationship with the council because, you know, without having a relationship there or being at the table, you're not able to negotiate the possibilities of getting new land and whatnot. This is from a community who ha have absolutely nowhere else to go and are se seriously threatened um, in terms of their housing. Um, there's that other half of us that are like, well, we already know what happens when we go and sit at the table with them. We get nothing. So that kind of historical um, legacy of, of getting nothing from councils is still there holding people back. But there are many positive examples of relationships with councils, so that so things like well well defined formal partnership arrangements and clear roles established by MOUs, mana to mana relationships where chief executives from Runag and Council meet formally and regularly. There are situations where there are voting positions for mana whenua on council committees or advisory roles. There are Māori commissioners appointed to RMA hearings, um, senior Māori staff or teams within council. Um, and the sort of getting to, to the um, kind of lower level of, of um, sort of positive partnerships, but they, they were particularly mentioning that when there are particular staff members who are receptive to mana whenua concerns, these will be their first point of contact, so they will seriously reach out to them. And also where councils are reaching out to mana whenua for input into council's own strategic plans and water management decisions. This is um, really important. And uh, here's a quote from one of the council interviews um, from, a, from a, a council staff member. We've got elected members that sit on particular committees, plus representatives from each district, plus representatives from iwi, and now we've got our one Māori seat as well. Yes, yeah, so there's already part of a construct but I wouldn't say it's co-governance, it's just representation. So there's kind of this, this, I guess, sliding scale of consideration of where you 
of, of very low level representation right through to co-governance or true partnerships. And a mana whenua quote, partnerships are going to benefit everybody. When you look at a lot of our values, a lot of the other members of our communities have the same or similar values anyway. And just my last slide, um, some of the positive exa of it, examples of resourcing and capacity building by councils. This is, this is uh, right across the board from either regional councils or district and city councils. So some things like funding towards commissioned reports on climate change risks, um, which are really uh, have been really welcomed. Um, funding and capacity assistance to developing adaptation plans or strategies, um, or funding staff within mana whenua organisations who provide information or decisions to support council processes, um, such as input into resource consent processes. Um, the direct funding of biodiversity work um, by mana whenua, um, an example where mana whenua members actually come physically into a council and hot desk on a regular basis to sort of improve those information flows and skill development and collaborations between mana whenua councils and government agencies and sometimes with researchers as well to protect impacted places or plan for adaptation. Um, and just finish on, on a couple of quotes, I guess the difference is that we've got that sense of kaitiakitanga and we're just there to look after it, to pass on. It's not ours, we don't own it, it's the next generation and the 10 or 20 generations that are coming that we're doing this for. And a council perspective was climate change is too big of a challenge for councils to do it all by themselves. Kia ora, and over to you, Graydon. Thanks, Janet. Uh... Cool. So I'm just going to talk about some of the findings from our council participants. So this first slide is really just around the um, the kind of key themes or challenges uh, that are coming through in terms of climate response for councils. So the first one, which I'm probably you're all really familiar with, is this um, problem of a lack of clarity. So pretty much all the participants we talked to uh, talked about a lack of clarity in relation to the role and expectations of local government for climate response. So some of the specific issues that came up around that were how to work across uh, different governance boundaries making decisions and issuing consents, uh, monitoring and enforcement amidst uncertainties. And lots of folks talked about how they were waiting on further national legislation, specifically the Climate Adaptation Act, to address that key question around who funds adaptation um, and then how to manage the kind of consenting, consenting monitoring and enforcement to try and reduce or avoid maladaptation. So this first quote here up here uh, gets to this thing here. You know, we're still getting requests for buildings, building and resource consents right on the edge of cliffs. And at the moment, based on our plan rules, some of them we have to approve. So the second key theme for a challenge was the capacity and resources. So lots of the participants we talked to talked about how they wanted to factor climate change into all decisions across council you know, whether it was three waters, transport, land use development. Um, however, integrating, uh, this integration can be a real challenge, right? Especially when in some councils they're characterized by silos or really strong disciplinary knowledges. So even where, and even where integration was being done, lots of participants still talked about how they were having difficulties recruiting and retaining skilled staff. Um, many were operating with, uh, you know, quite significant staff shortages sometimes that further compounds the ability to actually implement work plans. And then lots of people talked about how they were just feeling quite burnt out and exhausted. And that was a reflection of the, you know, crazy work program we've had and also the uh, extreme weather events that then, you know, that councils have to respond to those as well as dealing with all the reform that's going on at the moment. The third challenge was around titiriti. Um, so participants expressed kind of relationships with mana whenua in different ways. Um, and lots were really supportive of partnership and co-governance, but they uh, just noted that mana whenua groups were even more stretched than they were. And uh, council folks also had questions around how to actually do partnership and co-governance and navigate some of those political risks, including kind of the public backlash and racism that we're seeing playing out at the moment in various ways. So. Um, in response to these challenges and others, uh, we've kind of seen three broad themes emerge through the work so far. 
Uh, and this first theme is that most participants suggested that where possible, it was easiest to integrate climate response into existing processes and committees rather than setting up new ones within the council. And for smaller councils, this was particularly important because they just didn't have the staff time to set up new processes. And they also talked about this being a pragmatic starting point, especially if there isn't support from senior leadership within a council for new uh, processes or committees. The second key theme was that um, trying to kind of distribute your responsibility for climate response across teams and staff rather than it just falling on one officer or one team. And so um, for smaller councils, this was seen as particularly important um, as well. Um, and so, yeah, council folks talked about this, like trying to get asset managers, maintenance people, planners, parks and garden staff to all kind of factor climate response into their decision making and investment plans. And the third thing was just a um, bit more of, I suppose, a relational one, like, Lots of participants talked about um, being patient with their colleagues and inviting them to learn alongside each other. Uh, so recognising that climate response is just really new for lots of folks. So in the next few slides, I'll just talk about some of the specific ways these types of things are being uh, implemented. So the first one, uh, the first way is through mitigation. So lots of participants talked about the important role carbon auditing is now playing in the council to inform mitigation plans, which then get translated through action through annual and long-term plans. So approaches differ across the councils we worked with, but they kind of follow a similar process. So often you get an external consultant in to review council operations and or it might be a, a kind of district or regional emissions to establish a bit of a baseline. And then they identify low hanging fruit or actions that they could take. Um, so some of these actions are then managed as just as kind of business as usual. So it might just be replacing light bulbs, kind of simple stuff like that. Whereas others of it require long-term planning investment in often business cases. So examples of that type of stuff are just some ones here. So we've got moving from gas to electricity. It might be in like a, a council swimming pool, something like that. Uh, electrifying council vehicle fleets. Um, commissioning feasibility studies for organic waste diversion from landfill, uh, then looking at large scale native planting on council uh, controlled land or nature based solutions, green blue infrastructure, that kind of stuff. Uh, so participants identified a bunch of benefits from uh, mitigation work. Um, so you kind of, they often talk about it like you start with what you can control and council's operational missions are kind of the, the place where you can actually have some control. So yeah, a bit of a pragmatic starting point. Um, the second one is that lots of participants talked about council needs to get its own house in order first. So it was kind of a thing of, we're gonna start modeling the practices to the wider community first, and we're not gonna, you know, we're not just gonna tell them what to do if we're not doing it. Uh, and the third one is that, um, Participants talked about using these carbon auditing processes to actually embed climate considerations in decision making across a council. And some participants talked about the importance of um, having external consultants involved because their colleagues were more inclined to listen to them. Um, but other participants also kind of said there's a risk, you know, external consultants can cost a lot and sometimes they're used to manage political risk when actually what is just needed is kind of courageous leadership. So participants suggested using external consultants quite strategically. The second broad way, um, the second broad theme, I suppose, is uh, the role downscale climate projections, climate risk assessments, and exposure screenings are now playing in uh, council processes. So while the three regions we're uh, involved in are all at different stages in their risk assessments, um, climate data and downscale climate projections are really playing an important role in their decision making processes, which then get reflected through district and regional plans, policies and rules, and infrastructure investment. So across the three case studies, the regional council took the lead in implementing uh, or commissioning the data, I suppose, and then we're sharing it with territorial authorities. And most participants saw these risk assessments as a really important first step to gather that data and help build a shared sense of the impacts of climate change. So a key thing that participants suggested was really important was considering the data formats, spatial resolution, accessibility requirements, and then integrating that into the decision making. So to address some of these issues, participants described how from the very start of their risk assessments, they tried to ensure that any outputs would be in a format that would fit with an existing council systems. So we've just got a, a quote here. What we really had to do is to make sure that what comes out of the infrastructure risk assessments is in the right data form for them, aka the asset managers, to be able to use. So there's lots of work in the background there around how you then integrate what comes out of the infrastructure risk assessment into usable data sets in the way that asset managers use. So 
participants had different views on the best way to integrate uh, climate data into council processes, but there was a kind of general consensus that there's no point in reinventing the wheel or adding to already stretched processes. So what this meant in practical terms was that um, they were just plugging that climate risk assessment data into existing council processes. Uh, so, for example, Bay of Plenty Regional Council are using risk assessments to inform their planning on flood protection infrastructure, and New Plymouth District Council are using their risk assessments to inform district plan changes and stormwater planning. So the benefits of this approach is that you uh, use existing staff processes and structures, uh, you're distributing responsibility for climate adaptation more widely across the council, uh, and you're also reducing bottlenecks if only a few climate-related uh, staff are involved or, um, you know, key staff leave with their knowledge. So you're kind of trying to build that organisational knowledge rather than just relying on one or two folks. Um, so the th third broad way is uh, through councils are collaborating with others. So uh, all of our council staff talked about how they're working with other councils, Manafina groups and community groups on climate response. So in Taranaki and Bay of Plenty, an important cross-council collaborative initiative are the regional climate change working groups. Uh, so they were initially focused on the risk assessment work, but now they're moving beyond that. So uh, the, both of these groups are currently composed of primarily council officers and they're pretty informal. So there are no governance structures that feed back into the respective councils. Um, Participants talked about the way these groups are really good for sharing information, uh, understanding the risks, you know, the impacts of climate change, uh, building relationships with staff across councils, and they also use it to share what they're each doing and they try to align kind of work plans, engagement, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. Uh, Participants had different views on the benefits and disadvantages of the level of formalization of these uh, working groups. So some felt that they would benefit from more formal structures and maybe elected member and mana whenua representation in due course, while others really appreciated the flexibility that they've got at the moment. Um, so regardless of the kind of views on, how, yeah, the benefits or disadvantages of the level of formalization, everyone agreed that they were useful at the moment, um, particularly because of the level of uncertainty and reform facing local government. So it was kind of seen as regardless of the outcomes of any reform, having these groups um, helps us build our collaboration and align work programs. Um, so there's a whole bunch of challenges for councils engaging with communities. So I'm just going to talk about some, some approaches that um, have kind of come through as showing uh, positive benefits. Um, so for adaptation in particular, some of our participants suggested that councils kind of need to get out of the way and just to help resource communities, manifesto groups and others who are ready to act and lead. So examples of this type of approach are, are these, what are often called climate change adaptation grants. So Whanganui District Council and Bay of Plenty Regional Council are both using contestable community grants to resource community groups, businesses and mana whenua to take action. So at the time of our second interview, uh, Whanganui District Council had allocated $100,000 for these grants and they'd funded eight projects. Uh, they included a range of different things. So for the Waimiri uh, river boat to move away from coal, uh, predator free work, a bicycle repair, uh, food rescue and food production projects. Uh, the Bay of Plenty Regional Council had allocated $70,000 a year for the first three years of their long-term plan, and they've funded eight projects to date. And most of these are actually iwi or hapu-led and focused on understanding the impacts of climate change uh, for coastal marae and kainga uh, and impacts on food production and mahinga kai. So the benefits that were identified through these types of approaches, you know, you're working with communities um, who are already ready or keen to take action. So you're building on what is already happening rather than trying to reinvent or recreate it through other council processes. Uh, you're taking a community development led approach that enables rather than dictates. Uh, so that's particularly important for mana federal groups uh, to help them realize their aspirations. Um, you're helping to build and share knowledge. That so was kind of this idea that community are going to share that stuff amongst themselves more widely, so it's not all on council to do some of that work. Um, you're working at local scales that resonate with how people are actually experiencing climate change. Uh, and some participants also talked about the importance of building those kind of um, what one person called a stable vessel, uh, through which trust and understanding is built within a community that's going to help when we come to some of these more difficult climate related questions in due course. Um, yeah, so uh, council participants described a range of ways they hope to further support these types of community approaches. 
Um, so that includes listening to what mana whenua and community groups need to progress actions, uh, allocating more internal council staff time to help groups with, say, technical climate data, and Janet's already touched on that. Um, supporting mana whenua groups and community groups with aligned actions, so it might be kind of lining up events, planning with, you know, what these groups are wanting to do, uh, and also using uh, funding sources really strategically, so the long-term planning, funding and emergency response to support actions that have already been identified, say, in a climate adaptation strategy or something like that. So I suppose a few, few takeaways from our work so far. Um, Real clear messages about the significance of reform and disruption over the last few years for folks. Lots of people are feeling tired, overwhelmed, and for council folks in particular, the well-being of staff was a recurring theme that came through, something they're really concerned about. Um, then I suppose, for, yeah, again for councils, just you know, they're just one actor in the wider social transformation needed to respond to the climate and biodiversity crises. Um, and I suppose just from our perspective, you know, despite all of these challenges, we've seen some Lots of people have been taking action, but it's all at different stages and sometimes it's hard to kind of work out, <laughs> hard to see how all of that matters and makes, but you know, how it all connects. So um, for us, I think, while some of the stuff may seem small or tentative, I think, you know, it provides really useful examples to build on.